No running water, no phones, no power, no banks, no normality. Because in Afghanistan there rages a vicious civil war. And were it not for the Red Cross, there would be no hospitals, no clinics for the wounded and the sick. Kiwi Bob Makero lives in the capital, Kabul, and runs those clinics. For three years he has lived the Afghan war, spent days at a time in the bunker that is the first room you see when he shows you round his house. In recent days, a neighbour took a direct hit. And yet this Hokitika humanitarian, with a heart as big as his mountaineering boots, loves his Kabul. <laughs> Five o'clock in the morning on a spring day in Kabul. And Kiwi Bob Makero is going for a walk up the hill behind his place. Beautiful day. This is what keeps me sane, is um, just try getting out, soak in what I call Afghanistan beauty. Beauty and battle in rarefied air. It's important that you get out for a walk and see the beauty of Kabul. I mean, it's a superb city. But is it safe? Is it safe? Oh, I think everything you do in Afghanistan, you have to realize that the country's been at war. And He's taking me to see a site that is truly surreal in a city that's been 17 years at war. The signs are everywhere, but not always obvious. A few months ago, I, I wasn't prepared to come up here, so a bit scared of walking up here because of mine. But I got one of my friends from a British demining organization to check it out. And uh, he said, if we stick to the track, it's not too much of a problem. We are approaching an architectural triumph, built on a high place to celebrate Afghan achievement at the 1956 Melbourne Olympics. Now empty, unusable, ravaged by the savage Afghan war. It is, it was, a full-size Olympic swimming pool. Kabul has always excited extravagance, architectural and poetic, especially among its rulers. That was the founder of the Afghan nation, Ahmad Shah Durrani, so homesick. He used to say, you know, from the splendor of my Delhi throne, I have gold and treasures that uncountable, but I miss the richness, the beauty of Kabul. Bob McCarrow, mountaineer, poet, humanitarian, is from Hokitika, New Zealand, the world. A world he's seen much of with relief work in Ethiopia, Vietnam, India, the Pacific. Now he's in Afghanistan working for the Red Cross, keeping vital health services going, waiting for a peace long gone. Kabul, I think, was described beautifully by Babur, the first, first Mughal king that came here in the 15th century. He writes a poem about Kabul is a rose, but it needs a thorn to protect its beauty. And what you're seeing today is soldiers protecting Kabul's beauty. The Afghans have been at war since 1979, when the Russians invaded. Now, seven years after the Russians were beaten back, civil war still rages on. And Kabul, once beautiful, once elegant, is now largely destroyed. Four years ago, Kabul's population was four million. Now it is down to just over one million. Once these streets were crammed with cars, buses, traffic jams. Then came army after militia after army. During one six month period of fighting, it's estimated 45,000 people died in this city. And still it is true that no corner of Kabul knows peace. Once upon a time, they say, this used to be one of the most beautiful parts of Kabul, with restaurants, clubs, a carpet market. It's known as Jare Maiwan. It's named after a battle in which the British were routed by Afghan forces last century. Now Jare Maiwan has been routed, gutted itself. After years of war, first against the Russians, and then as Mujahideen fought among themselves. Indeed, they now say 75% of Kabul looks like this. And the effect of that on the people of this city has been devastating. And it was just absolutely horrific. I mean, uh, going there, two armies clashing, uh, bodies, kids running with, you know, fingers blown off, uh, quite horrific. When we arrived in Kabul, it was comparatively quiet. The Red Cross headquarters, our introduction to a city behind sandbags. You know, for the last one and a half, two years, rocket coming into Kabul have been a daily occurrence, so you just don't know what's going to happen, so you need to take precautions like sandbags. What's and, this here? Well, 
all our radio, all our vehicles have radios, and of course, I mean this. A few bullet holes, uh, a few bullet holes here, another two at the end of the vehicle. And have you ever been shot at, or your vehicle ever been well, shot at? This vehicle over here has a, a little sticker on the windscreen. If you have a look carefully, where? The sticker on the windscreen here, which covers up a, uh, a bullet hole. So. Um, yeah, I mean, it happens from time to time. I mean, it's not a big deal, but you have to be a little careful because... Isn't being shot at a big deal? Well, or does that mean you've been in Kabul a bit long? No, when I say is that 90% of Afghanistan is safe. And for Bob McCarrow, safety each night is a retreat to his comfortable Kabul home. A big house with a garden he created himself. This situation sums up your life, doesn't it? Sandbags here, roses here, beauty and battle. Yeah, it is. I mean, the whole history of Afghanistan is this dichotomy. I mean, the opposite. And, you know, to me, if it wasn't for the roses, the mountains and the poetry, I couldn't do this job. And the job is huge. Arranging funding for Red Cross centres like this one in Kabul, where every day hundreds of people turn up desperate for food. It didn't take long before we were approached. Dr. Hello, how are you? This nice centre you. is managed by a surgeon, Dr. Haidar. How many people are you feeding here today? Today, actually, or we are... distributing to Yes, we have 650 families today and another 650 families tomorrow. How many people are there like this in Kabul? At the present uh, situation, I would say the majority of the Kabul population are having a very tough time. I would say there are probably at least hundred thousands of people like these people that you see here today. And Dr. Haidar, a hero surgeon who used a cave as an operating theatre during the Battle of the Panjshir Valley against the Russians, now does battle with the scales of fairness, distributing basic foods to the desperately hungry. And then, as Dr. Haidar explains the enormity of his task, a woman pleads her case. Gather with us. Okay, it's just not in the order, but nevertheless, this is only today's paper. Does this woman want to say? She wants to see if I can give her in order so she can... I'm a widow. I'm a poor woman. What do you do? You've got her, Archie, a man and Yes. And our old man is back again. This man you've had dealings with before. Yes. Yeah. He's got a history in his face. Exactly, this was the point I wanted to say, that you just stole the words out of my mouth. You can see the face, you can see the skin complexion, not only on him, but you can see around you. I mean, the, the, it's obvious that these people are going through a difficult life. And so people wait and hope. Women and kids sort the wheat and the beans from the chaff and the dust and the dirt. And a check is made on the history of our old supplicants. Do you ever get people who want to double dip? Well, yes. I, I think our, our colleague here, our friend here, I mean, my heart goes out to him, but we've found out that he already has a distribution card already. He already gets his monthly ration. And, you know, he probably has the need for more food. But this is why good, accurate distribution ensure that people don't get a double, a double ration. Which is important for Bob McKero, who oversees distribution of the funding for the Food Distribution Centre. Funding which comes from as far afield as the Canterbury Westland branch of the Red Cross and the European Union. How useful is this man, Mr McKero, Bob McKero, to the work that you're doing? Well, I think that he is quite valuable. He is as valuable as gold and diamond. <laughs> A rough diamond, maybe. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Which is just as well, because for the time being, life in Kabul can only be described as rough. There is no electricity. Banks don't function. There's no running water. Little food. And on top of all that, a war. We're 20 minutes from downtown Kabul, and this is the front line of the world's forgotten Afghan war. This is the Dalaman Palace. It's a position held by the government troops of President Rabbani within recent days. This has been under fire from a position about two kilometers away across the valley, a position held by the Taliban. They're young, they're Muslim fund fundamentalists, they're inclined to hang those who disagree with them. And since we've been here, there's been responding government fire from a ridge just over there. We're expecting incoming, as they call it here, any minute. 
Again, there is something surreal about paying 50 US dollars and being driven past destroyed buildings to the front line. It's 20 minutes or so from the center of Kabul. We arrive in an ancient Peugeot taxi. The Red Cross couldn't take us, but Afghan Red Cross surgeon Dr. Zakria agreed to be our guide. And the front line itself? For the time being, it is the Dalaman Palace, built by the first king of Kabul, King Amanullah, on the day of independence. <coughs> so how far are the Taliban from here? Uh, from here, about two kilometers. And we just entered the oh, here. palace. It's a palace that's been the scene of ferocious fighting. Here. Changing hands seven times in the last few years. One of the soldiers. And is still under fire. And the sound of a shot welcomes us to the front line. This is the We walk kitchen. down once elegant corridors, past soldiers' facilities, and out into the direct firing line of the Taliban. No, no, that to be reborn. How far can we come? Just here, because the, if there's something happening, we have to go back. Okay. But then a bit of sage advice. Dr. Zekria has two kids. His instincts are to be trusted. I think it's better to go inside. Okay. Uh, yeah. Timely advice. Because For as we turn to go inside, the Taliban opened fire. Fortunately, not at us, but at a government tank on a hill a couple of kilometers away. War has meant life in Kabul is reduced to the basics. Water, which wouldn't pass any international test for hygiene, comes by the wheelbarrow load from street pumps. And firewood by the stone for cooking and for heating. There is an active market with vegetables, cheeses, and even a few luxuries like biscuits. And for your car, if you have one, you could buy petrol and get your bike fixed at the local repair shop. But inflation is huge. Cigarettes cost a bundle, literally. In a city which has been ravaged by war for 17 years, there are still blooms for the buying on Flower Street. But you can't go anywhere in Kabul without seeing the signs of the human victims of war, which gets us back to the Red Cross and Bob McCarrow. In a country where there is no such thing as a local GP, Makero is making sure there is a basic health system, overseeing the setting up and running of nearly 50 medical centres. So what sort of people come here? What illnesses? What conditions? The day-to-day -day illnesses, the chest infection the, and what have you. Um, so that's the, the, the curative part. This room here is the dressing room where people come in with minor injuries or the odd gunshot wound. But if there's any severe rocketing or bombing of the area, these clinics are really a hive of activity. I, I've been here a number of times when you see 30 or 40 people badly injured just coming into these clinics on donkey car, taxi, being carried in. Is the Red Cross, the Red Crescent, making a difference here? If you look at what the ICRC and the International Federation are doing in Afghanistan, I mean, we're supporting the Afghan Red Cross or Afghan Red Crescent to run Clinics nationwide, you saw this morning the orthopedic centres, the hospitals, orphanages, welfare programs, pull the Red Cross out of Afghanistan and there'd be virtually no infrastructure here. Now you've got a theory about Afghanistan, the cycle that this country is going through at the moment. They got the Russians out, they're in civil war, it looks hopeless, but you're not hopeless, are you? No, no, I mean... <laughs> The, flower, the flowers are growing, the Afghan poets are still writing their rubaiyats or couplets. And then one evening, perhaps as a sign Bob McCarrow might be right, near the front line we come across an image straight out of the anti-war 60s. We want to know why you've got the rose in the gun. I put this flower because uh, all of the people are fed up with the fighting and uh, tired. We want peace and to end this war. We had been out and about, and as soldiers did when they saw Bob McCarrow, they invited us to tea, or chai as they call it here, and a story or two. They make you pray. They thought I was an Afghan, so they said to me, uh, pray. <laughs> you feel very passionately about this place, don't you? <laughs> I want to know why. I mean, why does a New Zealander 
feel so at home, feel so passionate about this extraordinarily different place. You've been to Hokitika. You know, you look at the mountains from Hokitika, Cook, Tasman, the whole Southern Alps. There are great similarities between the mountains of New Zealand, the mountains of Afghanistan. What about the, the people, people of Afghanistan? The people, the, the, the backcountry farmers of the West Coast or Canterbury are not unlike, <laughs> say, the Afghans. So a rough, tough Kiwi boy can feel at home at the foot of the Hindu Kush. Yeah, I mean, it, it's home. And, you know, I love beauty. I love poetry. I don't like the tragedy, but, but is it, it is a country of great beauty, of, 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 of brilliant colours, of... If it is a, an inspiring country. He stands convicted as Australia's worst serial killer, Ivan Milat, the man responsible for what have become known as the backpacker murders. And this week, the frightening revelation that this brutal killer lived here in New Zealand for three years while he was on the run from the law in the 1970s. Ivan Milat might still be at large, were it not for the luck and courage of a young British tourist, Paul Onions, who was just moments away from becoming another victim. Instead, he was the one who got away. Charles Woolley has Paul's chilling story. Paul Onions is the only person to stare down the barrel of Ivan Milat's gun and live to tell the story. And just as well, because Ivan Milat could still be at large and still be killing if it wasn't for this young Englishman and his love of adventure. Australia seemed the one last place I thought on earth where there was plenty of um, adventure left. The last frontier. No, the last, that's how I imagine it. Where men are men. I, I thought, you know, give me a chance to relax after being in the Navy and get a job and uh, see plenty of sunshine and have a good look around. As a teenager, it was the Royal Navy that gave Paul the travel bug. By age 24 and working as an air conditioning mechanic, he wanted to travel again, this time with a backpack around Australia. So Paul left his job in Birmingham and flew to Sydney. At first he stayed in a youth hostel with a few mates. Then he took a train to Sydney's outskirts to hitch a ride down the Hume Highway. He was headed for Mildura to go fruit deep. It was the Australia Day long weekend of 1990. You were wandering along here? Yes. Looking for something to drink? Yeah. So it all comes back? Oh, yeah. G'day, mate. Hi, Dad, have you? He approached you. Oh, as I came out of the shop, he says, do you need, he see me rucksack on my back, he says, do you need a lift? And I thought, oh, great, yeah. Hold this, you can't, put me back in the back and we'll get going. Yeah, yeah. My lucky day. Yeah, brilliant. Just, that's all I need. So this is where the uh, journey starts. And you meet your first Australian. Yeah. <laughs> well, I thought it was, he looked a bit like, um, Dennis Lilly to me. The cricketer? Because <laughs> I like cricket. And the only Australians I'd really seen was at the cricket match. So that, it was a big impression at first. I thought, oh, you know, as you laugh to yourself, I thought, oh, it's Dennis Lilly like. If only Paul knew. Just a couple of weeks before, the man he was sitting next to murdered two Melbourne backpackers, Deborah Everest and James Gibson. Paul was to be the next target. As Malat drove toward his killing ground, Paul began to sense him getting edgy. He be became a bit anti-racial to the, you know, the immigrants who were living in Australia. He found them, you know, quite offensive, really. You go out west and you don't know if you're in Vietnam or bloody China. I was so happy to get get the, the ride. And then all of a sudden, I thought, oh no, first go, I've got the, I've got.